Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome to a Sunday edition of Mailbag. I'm your host, Mark Ellis. Yes, I'm here today, and I have 45 minutes before I hit the driving range with Makuga, David Griffin, and Perry Nemiroff, so why not swing by the Collider Studios to talk some mailbag and field some questions? I'm joined by my best friends in the world, <laughs> Sinead DeFries. Oh, hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. I'm still feeling like crap, but I am also very happy to be here with my <laughs> Two best friends in the entire world. <laughs> what a sunny personality on her. And now we go over to Mark Riley, another good buddy of mine. I feel the love in the room right now. My two best friends as well. What a wonderful Sunday. Why are you so far away from us? <laughs> I don't know. This is just where I was told to sit. <laughs> I feel like Sinead's a raft. I'm a, I'm a FedEx plane and you, sir, are Tom Hanks. <laughs> drifting away. I am, and I have a horrible toothache. I hope some oh, no. ice skates show up on this island. <laughs> well, before he gets any ideas about that ledge up there, let's start this show. <laughs> Sinead is going to read us some topics. Riley, I, and maybe Sinead will participate in answering the questions, and we hope we do a good job thanks to your moral support. What's up first? All right. Jack writes, I watched a Coen Brothers documentary on Vice, and it was, um, I'm thinking, in intimated? It was intimated. Yes. Intimated, Inferred. Yeah. Inferred. Mm. Suggested. Oh, see, this is why I do this show, just learning new vocab words that they could have directed the 1989 Batman movie. What popular wow. film do you think would have been better if a rumored director directed it instead? Uh, not 1989's Batman. I think that was pretty safe in Tim Burton's hands and glad he took the reins. You know, it's funny though, there's a lot of movies that at one time a director was attached and they had to go away from the project, whether it was the studio saying, ah, we think we like this person better, somebody else became available. Sometimes the writer of a project steps in and is like, no, I only want this guy directing my movie. Um, this all came into play in the early 90s when a little property known as Jurassic Park was being optioned because it was a pretty popular novel by Michael Crichton. Yeah. Everybody wanted to make a dinosaur movie. We started to have the CGI effects to be able to pull it off believably. You know who was uh, one of the rumored directors of Jurassic Park before Steven Spielberg? I don't know. The director of 1989's Batman. Tim Burton. No kidding. Tim Burton could have gotten a hold of Jurassic Park. Wow. And, but, you know, if you if you look at a visual artist like Tim Burton, I don't know that anybody could have predicted the groundbreaking visual effects that Steven Spielberg and the Imagineers at Industrial Light and Magic pulled off in 1993. But Tim Burton, not a bad backup for Jurassic Park. Uh, it's also believed that Roger Corman had a shot at Alien before Ooh, Ridley Scott got involved. So Roger right. Corman, another guy who probably would have done some really cool effects, what we had back in 1979. Those are a couple of fun ones for you. Riley, what do you got? Uh, I have an interesting one. I don't know if the movie would have turned out as successful, but James Cameron was originally attached to direct Spider-Man, and I thought that was fascinating. Right. He actually wrote a script that I heard was not very good for some reason. I, I, I can't remember the specifics, but he was going to tackle Spider-Man. Now, the other one that I think would have absolutely made a better movie Matthew Vaughn was supposed to direct X-Men 3 which ended up being The Last Stand directed by Brett Ratner so I think we know <laughs> we could probably infer that we would have had probably a better movie because Matthew Vaughn is one of my favorite directors those are the two that that popped to my mind here's a, a really interesting one too is The Godfather uh, uh -huh. before Francis Ford Coppola in line to do it was Sergio Leone yeah, if we want to stay on that, we were just talking about this. George Lucas, Apocalypse Now. Right, He right. was supposed to do it after Star Wars, but he wanted to, I don't know, keep telling some that, that story with Empire Strikes Back. Good move. I, I, Good I move. guess it ended up paying off okay for sure. uh, Jorge. You know, what's interesting is that usually the way movies play out, we're like, oh, I'm glad that person ended up doing it. And mm. I think, uh, I can't think of a better example of that than Jaws. Because Steven Spielberg directed Jaws, as we all know and love. A guy named Dick Richards was originally, yes, Dick Richards. Oh, Richard, di oh Dick Richards. Is, so basically, because a lot of people that they're named Richard can go by Dick, his name was Dick Dix, was going to direct <laughs> Jaws. And he ended up, be, he was one of the producers of, of a bunch of stuff i think he did tootsie later in his career okay but i can't imagine anybody telling that story the way steven spielberg did so yeah. uh glad he was on that and jurassic park for that matter yeah. all right Sinead, what's our next question why would you name your kid richard richards oh man there's i i, I don't want to i don't want to out this guy but i'll tell you guys off camera there's a kid at, at school i went to and he had the worst middle name oh, of yeah? all time i'm just gonna tell you the middle name was holding was his middle name was Holding. Oh, I Holding. got so excited. And I'm not going to tell you what the last okay, name is. Okay, don't forget, okay? But I won't. But, don't but if your last name was this, you should not name your kid's middle name Holding. Okay. 
<laughs> hold, <laughs> not Holden Caulfield, but uh, holding. holding. Okay, as in I'm holding something in my hand. I'm sorry. Oh. I've never been more excited for anything in my life. That's I <laughs> bet you need to live more life then. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sinead, what's the next question you're holding? <laughs> All right. The next question I'm holding is Nick writes, Hey, Collider crew, love the show. My question is, what's going on with the DC movies? Although I liked Man of Steel, it seems like Warner Brothers is trying to throw everything but the kitchen sink in every movie and failing to piece together a strong movie. One of the things that Marvel did well was getting us attached to Iron Man, then Captain America, then Thor, while sprinkling Easter eggs that would eventually lead to their ultimate team up. I personally thought Man of Steel was a great film, but since then, DC hasn't lived up to expectations for many. Do you think it's a matter of trying to incorporate too much too fast, poor script writing, directors missing the mark, studio interference, or what? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Yes, it's all of the above. Uh, (laughs) I said this in my uh, little tweet review of Suicide Squad. I think that... DC reverse engineered the Marvel formula and they went directly to Batman v Superman, which come on, it's Justice League. It's basically a Justice League movie. They tried to shove every character in there trying to get Avengers money. Avengers made, it became the third highest grossing film of all time. That made DC take notice. And instead of focusing on a Man of Steel sequel or maybe a Batman movie or a Wonder Woman movie doing what Marvel did, they are shoving every character they have into these movies, including Suicide Squad. And in doing that, they're rushing to a release date. We've seen all the backstory of the Suicide Squad. And then we get to the script issues. David Ayer had six weeks to write Suicide Squad. It shows. And then it, it, they, they want these movies to make a billion dollars, and they're not. I think that they would have, over time, made more money, pleased the fans more, had more critical, critical success with their standalone movies. I think we would have had a major box office, uh, box office whatever with Man of Steel 2, Batman for sure, Wonder Woman's going to kill it, and then you make a Justice League. And we get to know these characters more. The scripts are d- already developed. The characters are developed more. I think it would have been a, such a better play. But they didn't do it. I Why think is that? Both studios were starting out with blank slates. I think that might have been a great way to go. But you yeah. got to remember, DC had a couple dirty roles. If you can call the great Batman trilogy that Christopher Nolan made a dirty role. Because while those movies are awesome, well, two and a half of them are awesome. Then that really set DC back because they could no longer utilize Christian Bale as Batman in exactly. there. There are even rumors that Christian Bale was going to come back for a while and yeah. join this new universe. So DC is like, oh, we don't really know what to do. It felt like it was going to be too early to do a standalone Batman movie and re, uh, you know, invigorate that universe with a new dude playing Bruce Wayne. They didn't want to do that yet on their own. So they're right. like, oh, we got the perfect way to get him in. We, we make Man of Steel too, but we put Batman in there and it's Batman versus Superman. I think that was the right way to do it, considering that not only did they have to come off the previous Batman, but they also really got shaken up by the Green Lantern. Yeah. not doing well and the critical reception so I don't look at DC as having a problem I look at DC as the norm for launching a franchise I think Marvel here is the outlier because yeah. nobody could have predicted that Iron Man was going to be that great and that successful so after Iron Man when you had Captain America and Thor which are movies that I really like but they're not Iron Man Right. So if you had started off with the Thor, I think maybe you would have heard more critics be like, well, that was okay, but we didn't love this. But because Iron Man got such momentum getting right out of the gate for Marvel, that really helped every movie subsequently because you could go see Thor or Captain America or any of these other movies. And even if you didn't love the film, you could tell it was leading towards something because you could see little Easter eggs of things that were going to be the Avengers. Yeah. DC never got that chance. So I think DC pounced on their universe the right way based on the cards that they had. Mm -hmm. And I think that DC is going to be fine going forward. I really do. I didn't love Suicide Squad, but I still have a lot of faith in what Justice League can be. I think there's going to be a little bit of course correction from the tone of Batman versus Superman. And I have all the confidence in the world right now in Justice League. Maybe not in Zack Snyder, but in the brain trust that is DC to make a great Justice League movie. Sinead, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, I feel like whenever, like when I watched Batman v Superman, I didn't hate it as much as everyone else did. I liked it a lot. That was 
yeah, better than and, Suicide Squad for the, me. But the only thing I could really say negatively about it was that it just seemed like they were a little confused. And yeah. like, that's kind of the general feeling I have about it. And honestly, I kind of feel for them. Like, I feel sorry for them a little bit because Marvel is just like killing it, like left, right, and center. And sometimes I look at the DC characters and I'm like, I sometimes like them a little bit more than what Marvel has. They're just not, they're just confused. They don't know what to do with them. And I agree with what he's saying, that they're throwing everything at us way too fast. And it's really sad because Suicide Squad, I think, could have been incredible. Yeah. And the general consensus is that, like, this movie makes not a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. And I think that Marvel just, we, we give them the credibility now, even subconsciously, to pick and choose what source material they want to actually put in the movies, where I think DC maybe feels a little bit more pressure to put more things from mm -hmm. the comic books to appeal to the hardcore fans, yeah. where sometimes if you are trying, like Sinead said, trying to cram too much of that stuff into a movie, it can alienate the masses that aren't as familiar with the source material. So it's a really tough thing to navigate. I think that after seeing that little clip that we got of Justice League and seeing that Wonder Woman trailer at Comic-Con, I have a lot of faith in DC going for it I really do. I do and I and I think Wonder Woman is actually going to be the saving grace for God, I hope so. because I think I think they're really doing something different with uh, Patty Jenkins being behind the camera on this and I think that that's that's more of along the lines of my point that I was making they got a very interesting filmmaker to 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 make Wonder Woman and they're focusing on Wonder mm -hmm. Woman and they're going back to World War One these are all the things that I thought they the, I, if they looked at the Dark Knight which was that was the third highest grossing movie of all time. I thought they would have just mm -hmm. followed that for me a little bit more rather than going to the Batman v Superman route, but that's just my opinion. All right. All right, what's up next? Nicholas writes, what films do you love but find hard to recommend due to due to their disturbing content or depressing subject matter? Um, well, actually, on Friday, uh, Sinead and I were on Movie Talk, and we had a pretty fun conversation about this with Dennis and John Roca yeah. uh, about movies that you just, that you know they're good movies, but they just, you feel icky watching them. My examples were Rachel Getting Married and Margaret, which if you haven't seen them, I can't recommend checking them out, but just know what you're getting into. Something I'll add to that list as far as disturbing content goes is a movie movie two, two movies I find awesome but I would not send my mom to see and that's the raid one and two because oh. they are so violent mm. and it's so visceral and it looks so realistic that I would not say if you go see the raid and you love action movies you're gonna dig it but the raid is not like you know tango and cash you know it's not like point break where you can just go in and you know have a good time and it's not too graphic in nature but the raid be prepared for awesomeness but also be prepared for a lot of gore and blood and guts and stuff yeah, I go with uh, kids. I don't know if you've seen kids. Have Never seen, seen kids. I remember it coming out when I was a tyke. And, uh... Talk about disturbing. Yeah. I mean, there is a scene in that. I could only see it once. I think I've seen it twice in my lifetime. But I can't. Re I mean, I recommend seeing it because it's, it's very disturbing. But it was also a great window into that time period with these kids on the streets of, I believe it's New York, and what they're doing during the HIV scare that, oh, God, there's a scene where you know this character you know that he has something, and then he does something that is so disturbing. I cannot, I can't even mention it. You probably, I feel everybody's like I've seen it. seen this movie. Hey, it's me. It's Casper. It's Casper. It's if there kids is, running it, around. You'll know. Sex you and you viewers needles. at home, if you know what I'm talking about, it's a move. It's a scene towards the end of the movie where I went, oh God, oh, oh God, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening because of the setup. It's one of those disturbing things. And the second one is the accused. I mean, have seen Jodie oh, Foster. Yeah, that's. Uh, uh, I think she was nominated for an Oscar. She might easy. even want. Yeah. It's not an easy movie to watch. She was obviously raped in the movie, and it was all about the fallout after that. The rape scene is in incredibly brutal. That it's it's like I can't watch it. It's so, a very good movie, though. It's, it's a very just, good it's movie. It's just very very. These tough are to good watch. movies. They are so well made, and they make you think, and they make you go, "Oh God, that really this is so real in life." And oh, I can't watch it yeah. again. Sinead, what uh, disturbs you? What bothers you? How do we get under your skin? Honestly, you guys, I don't watch a lot of disturbing movies. There you go. I'm, if I'm being real. Yeah. Um, when we talked about that on, on Mailbag, or not on Mailbag, on Movie Talk, too, I don't watch a lot of disturbing movies because I it really gets to me. For me, the only things that come to mind are like horror movies, and I've even learned my lesson with that, yeah. too. Um, but I think of like... Just like blood and guts. I guess the closest thing I can think of to even being the last kind of like icky movie that I watched but I love is like 13. I love that movie, but it's also oh, yeah. like really mature content matter. And it's only disturbing because the kids are so young. I mean, they're like yeah. in middle school. But other than that, it's like, 
I, I don't you just know. try to stay away from horror movies, especially stuff like I don't even enjoy like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like it just I, I, I don't like watching that stuff. That gets I mean, a little I've too. I've seen it, but it's just like there's just too much blood and I'm just like over yeah, it. Yeah, the torture porn thing. I'm, I've never really been involved in that. Uh-huh. So uh, that's just not for me. All right. Yeah. What's up next? Kenny writes, hey, Glider Crew, I love all the content you guys put out and can't stop watching your videos and reading your articles. Well, thank you, Ken. My question is fairly simple. What do you think has been the best original film of the year so far? Mine would be Green Room or The Nice Guys. Thanks for taking time to read and answer my question. P.S. Ashley Mova and Sinead should be on the Schmoes No Show way more often. Book them, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think, I think you guys should be on the show. Aww, and I'm yeah. going to take one of yours, Kenny, Green Room. One of my favorite movies. Speaking of, of the year. kind of disturbing, sometimes violent and movies. disturbing. I, you know, what occurred to me, but I think I could watch that again just because it's it is so well done, and it's the disturbing that you that becomes a, a very satisfying ending. Mm-hmm. That's why I like it because, oh boy, if you haven't seen Green Room, it is one of the best made movies of the year. It's it's a very original idea. I didn't even really think about the idea until I, I got this question, but it is very very original and it's so good. One of the best, top ten for sure this year for me. The other one is The Witch. Have you seen The Witch yet? Oh, yeah. Holy crap. If you want a scary movie and something that is just so unsettling, the opening of the movie, ridiculous, very original, interesting, great performances, mood, all that. It's it's a fantastic movie. Well, you might have kind of taken mine. So I will go to my backup and say Swiss Army Man is a movie that it just it totally uh, came out of the blue for me. Had no idea what it was. It got a lot of buzz coming out of Sundance because it was known as the farting corpse movie. But it is. It is so much more than that. And I saw it with our buddy JT and it took me about 20 minutes to get locked into the movie, like yeah. to be like, okay, what exactly are we watching here? But once you're on this weird, wild adventure, it really ends up being satisfying. And it's a movie that you want to talk about afterwards with whoever you saw it with. Because you yeah. know me, usually I see a movie and I don't want to talk to anybody. I just bolt yeah. out. I just want to get the hell out of there and be alone with my thoughts. I wanted to talk to everybody that was in that theater about what we just saw in Swiss Army Man. It's a really cool movie. Again, not for everybody and it takes some time to get into it, but if you invest the energy, I think it's going to feel rewarding for you. Nice. I have a question. Can we put uh, in movie taglines farting corpse movie? <laughs> Is that the official tagline? No. The farting corpse movie. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what the actual Swiss Army Man is, but it's just know, right? it's just so good. It's the movie's really good and uh, Paul Dano is just one of those guys. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe's great as a course, but Paul Dano, like I was still kind of watching him as Brian Wilson from Love and Mercy oh, last he was year. Great, and uh, that guy's just he is a treasure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's our next question, Sinead? Philip writes, what's up, shit rats? Has the movie trilogy... I love how that's such like a normal thing now. I don't respond to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Has the movie trilogy been thrown to the wayside in favor of the cinematic universe? Thanks for taking my question and keep it up. Well, Philip, uh, I have some bad news for us that even the movie trilogies that we love and celebrate sometimes don't stay trilogies. Uh, if you look at the history of great trilogies, what do you got off the top of your head? You got your Star Wars, you got your Lord of the Rings, you got your Indiana Jones. They ain't trilogies anymore, man. I mean, yeah. we, we got three more. I guess we got another trilogy in The Hobbits. You can either consider Lord of the Rings just one huge thing, or you can go with those three movies and then go with the three other Hobbit movies. Same thing with the prequels to a certain extent where you can get episodes one through three and then the classic trilogy in Star Wars. But you're right. We seem to be going more towards a cinematic shared universe. I think that really helps out with comic book movies. Yeah. That you're not tied down to that three-movie structure. But I do find an appeal, and maybe it's just because it's my generation, of a trilogy of having a movie that kicks off and we we get to it be introduced to this new universe and then two gets a little darker gets a little more intense maybe the good guys don't win but it's okay because we know we got another movie coming around the corner in two or three years and that's going to make everything all right back to the future is a trilogy yeah. that uh i i enjoy all three of the movies but it's never nothing will ever recapture the magic of the first Back to the Future. Riley, are we done with trilogies, or do you think the shared universe is just borrowing some time? I think it's just a sign of just business and the studio system. Mm -hmm. If the third movie, especially if it's wrapping up the trilogy and it does a billion dollars at the box office, there's going to be part four. And they're going to say, oh, maybe it's a new trilogy. or They just want to make more movies that make money. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, yeah, I guess we're kind of losing. The Dark Knight trilogy would be one that I would also bring up. That was kind of an open and shut trilogy. Nolan even said, nope, story's done. Mm -hmm. That's why we had to get Ben Affleck as Batman again. So, yeah, I think it's more about the just 
the studio side of things and making a lot of money and that they're going to do that no matter what. And look at Spider-Man was a trilogy, Sam Raimi, and the last one didn't do very well. They were looking to do part four, right. but then everything fell apart and they rebooted. So It's a great call with the Dark Knight trilogy because that's the only example I can think of of where, even though it ended on somewhat of a high note, you, as far as, you know, financially. Yeah. It, they still, they're like, no, 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 that's, that's it with Batman. And even though the studio maybe wanted Christian Bale mm -hmm. to come back, they're like, nope, that's, that's it with that Batman. Because you're right, Spider-Man ended up being three movies, but they sure. wanted more movies. So it's a tough thing to, out of the gate, say we want to make a trilogy. Because you have to make a great first movie to get people coming back. But if you make it too good, people are going to want more and more stories. That's why horror movies, they, they never stop at part three. No. They always go to like part seven or part eight because if you can keep making money with these things, do it. And with these huge universes in the comic book world, I'm glad that we're not limited to trilogies by and large simply because I love seeing these movies. Yeah. So let's have the more, the merrier, but I'll always have my classic trilogy of Star Wars. All right, what's up next? Kevin writes, why do you ladies and gents believe there is an obsession about critic reviews being good for superhero movies, especially DC movies, today before even checking them out themselves? How does a RT, Rotten Tomato score, validate if a movie is good to you or not? I don't get this obsession. It's never been like this before where a superhero movie comes out and the critic ratings are all that matters to these people. My, fave com my favorite comic book movies like The Crow, Kingsman, and Man of Steel do not have high ratings, and I don't care. would love to hear your take. It's an interesting question. I, I, I love this question, actually, I, because I don't really have an answer. I don't know why the, these... It, it's almost like there's a war being fought online over between fans and critics, and it, it wasn't like that before. Um, I, I look at it as a sign of the times there's a lot more social media you have a lot more access to information you can chat with your friends on however many devices you can go on reddit you can you can gather fans of your own opinion and then turn around and point them at somebody and go you're wrong and i think it's also a sign of the times we're in in the world that there's a lot of shit going on out there and people just seem like they're uh, they're ready to fight you on the internet for Whatever reason, it could be your support of Trump or Hillary. You know, you'll get in some, you'll get in a, a fight about that. I think it just really comes down to these fans really want DC fi uh, films to do well. They had the critics haven't really found them to do as well as maybe Marvel or some of the earlier like Batman, Dark Knight, all that kind of stuff. So fans are are making it known that they disagree with you. And so it's become a thing. I don't know, Alice, give me some more on this. People want their opinion validated. It's as yeah. simple as that. And with the internet now, you have this place, you have this magic place. It's kind of like buying a lottery ticket when you can go on there and say, oh man, if the numbers come up right, everybody's gonna agree with me. And we'll all have a great time and celebrate this thing that I love together. Or a lot of people out there don't like what you like and it's really gonna hurt your feelings. And I understand that. It was a lot easier when I was a kid and I'd read USA Today. I'd read that and see what they said about Demolition Man. And if they didn't like Demolition Man, I'm like, that's just USA Today, you know? Exactly. I'm not going to go. I didn't have the, the means to go seek out every other critic under the sun. Maybe I'd catch is Siskel and Ebert on TV, but that was it, you know? And now that you can look at everybody's opinion out there, and if it starts to get a little overwhelming, well, that's natural, but it shouldn't influence your love or your dislike of a particular movie. It's going to be okay. Enjoy what you enjoy and have fun with it. I think part of it is the new generation of kids that grow up and everybody gets a trophy. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets accepted. Everybody wins. And that's not always the case. You're not always going to be in the majority with your opinions. There's a lot of things that I like that I know not a lot of other people like. As crazy it is for you guys to believe, there's people out there that don't think Van Halen is the greatest hard rock band of all time. What? I know it's shocking to hear, <laughs> but there's people Dude, out there I'm that believe here. it. God, yeah, come on. it's crazy that somebody would put another band better than Van Halen, but it's out there and that's fine with me. I enjoy arguing, but even more than that, I enjoy what I love. So even though people might laugh at me when I'm driving in my car and I'm blasting the song Rome by the B-52s. <laughs> I'm having a great time, dude. That's Enjoy a good song. life. Life is too short to all you to, to have all your fears and concerns and all these things validated by what the internet says. Go outside, walk around the block and enjoy the sunshine and enjoy your opinions because nobody can tell you what to think. Yeah. What's your what's your take on all this, Sinead? 
I mean, I think it's sad. There's like a really great saying that's like the best thing about the internet is that everyone has a voice, and the worst thing about the internet is that everyone has a voice. Right. Yeah. Um, but the whole Rotten Tomatoes thing, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's people like to have their opinions validated, and it's also because of the internet. Movie reviewers have always been around. Yeah. But we just have a lot of access to a lot of things that we didn't before. And um, comic book movies have really changed pop culture in a sense as well, where a lot of people are paying attention to movies more than yeah. ever before because of the rise of the mm -hmm. MCU and everything. Like pe people who didn't necessarily love that geek culture have, have found a love for it mm -hmm. um, in a different way. So I think that that's why. But when it comes down to it, I've said this so many times in this show before. This is such a people ask this question a lot with the reviews and I get why it's upsetting or why you don't understand it if you have interest in a movie then read the reviews and just stick to that like don't let the review change your mind and whether or not to see it like I remember when Spectre came out and everyone was like um oh, well you know should I see it now or blah, blah. I'm like go see it like shut up yeah <laughs> like why because because even if one of us said we don't like a movie like who what the hell do you care? Just yeah. go see the movie. If you would, if you don't care about a movie, and then your reviewer says like, "Oh, it was crap," and you're like, "All right, then that's fine." But like, why would you not see a movie because you read read somewhere that someone else didn't like it? Like, at the end of the day, we could have the greatest movie movie reviewer in the world, but they're still the greatest movie reviewer in the world to like you, and then to someone else, they might be the worst movie reviewer in the world. It's all like. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's I mean, a personal it's, opinion. My, my exactly. barometer is always that, like, if I really want to see a movie, I'm going to see it regardless of what exactly. anybody else tells me. me I, if there's a movie that I'm on the fence about, and I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I should see Bad Moms. I don't know if it's funny. It doesn't look that good from the trailers. I might rely on a critic to tell me whether to go see it in the theater or not. Right. Like, that's like my, like, maybe I'll go see it in the theater if they say it's good. If they say it's uh, you can miss it, I'll wait until I can Netflix or, or something. Yeah. And then there's movies I just plain don't want to see. That might read a review and it's glowing, and I'm like, ah, oh, it's fine. I'm not paying to see that movie. Yeah. But, um, yeah, just, uh, just have some confidence in your opinion. Everybody just needs more confidence, mm -hmm. okay? And not everybody gets a trophy. And Dan Halen kicks ass. What's our next con? <laughs> all right. Spencer right? Take Light Crew. Love all the content coming out right now. My question is about, of course, Star Wars. Before yes. we were given the title for Force Awakens, the movie was referred to as Episode 7. Once we got the title, all the marketing called the movie The Force Awakens, leaving out Episode 7. All the trailers, TV spots, books, etc. left it off. Even the Blu-ray box cover and menu says Star Wars The Force Awakens and leaves off Episode 7. The only time Episode 7 is ever used is in the opening crawl. Why do you think this is? Do you think Lucasfilm will leave off F Episode 8 in the marketing? I think they should use it to differentiate it from Rogue One and the other anthology movies and to let the audience know this is the next saga film. Would love your take on this. Thanks for taking my question. And I'm with Christian. Would love a Kenobi movie with Ewan McGregor. Yeah. That's a hell of a question, Spencer. It's something I really didn't consider before. But you're right. You never really saw episode seven in the marketing. To be honest, you don't see episodes four through six all that much or as much. I think you even see it more now than you used to because you need to know the numbers to differentiate them more from the prequels, which I think are more prominently referred to as one, two, and three. Yep, At least when I'm hanging out with my buddies, that's how, I mean, we usually go by the title of the movie, mm -hmm. and I think it'll be the same thing, whether it's The Force Awakens or Episode 8, whatever it's called. It's going to go by the title of the movie, but Spencer has an interesting angle on this where they do want to differentiate it from Rogue One and let everybody know it's not a continuation of that story that we're going back. Now, obviously, you're going to see uh, trailers and you're going to see images and, and, and shots and all that good stuff of our heroes that we now know and love from The Force Awakens coming back. So we'll be able to get it. Yeah. But I don't think it's a bad idea to maybe lean on the Episode Eight moniker a little bit more than The Force Awakens did. Plus, The Force Awakens was such a cool name for what was going on in the Star Wars universe. Yeah. I think I think The Awakens, they really wanted to hammer that home as opposed to this is part seven of a movie franchise. It's like The Force Awakens, we're not relying on a number here. We're telling you that Star Wars is back. I think that's why they leaned on it so hard. How about you, Riley? Yeah, that's exactly right, in my opinion, too. They, I think when we went back to episode one, two, and three, funny how I use those as well, yeah. it was Star Wars that start to kind of come back into the consciousness, if you will. All the, the comic books and the, and the books and all these things, everybody was jonesing for a new Star Wars, and then George Lucas went, okay, 
you're getting the prequels. Here's episode one because we had that mm -hmm. huge fandom of, oh my God, we're getting the story of Darth Vader. So episode one, ooh, and episode two, okay. So they referred to him a lot. Then the backlash for the prequels started and we had no Star Wars for a while. And so when Disney right, bought it, right. and it's what you're saying, The Force Awakens, new Star Wars, they wanted to distance themselves from all the episode titles to let you know Star Wars is back and it's The Force Awakens. So it's lunchboxes, toys, posters, all Force Awakens, no episode seven. Mm -hmm. The diehard fans, we did our Star Wars draft. Who's going to be in <laughs> episode seven? I still haven't eaten the sushi. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, so we use that a lot. I think now that Star Wars is back in a big way, you're right. Rogue One doesn't have any episode title. It barely has a Star Wars story on it. It's just known as Rogue One. Rogue One. Now we need to get to it's episode eight. Fill in the blank on the title. I think they are going to bring back episode eight because now all the fans out there, Star Wars, The Force Awakens being the biggest, one of the biggest blockbusters of all time, they're going to want to know this is episode eight off of Force Awakens. It's going to be really interesting seeing what the the masses out there and how, how easy they recognize that Rogue One is not a continuation. Because I still, like, like I'm a huge fan of the Dan Patrick show. I listen to it every morning driving into work. And those guys were talking. They're smart guys, and they, like, watch Game of Thrones and stuff in addition to covering sports. And they're like, so wait, so Rogue One, is that, is that this? And it's like, how do you guys not know this? But then uh, yeah. again, we haven't seen much from Rogue One. And people that aren't in our space, once you see the trailers, it's just going to be really interesting to see, like, around November when there's, the, you know, as for the stuff on TV and Monday Night Football, it's like, okay, here's the Rogue One trailer. Is everybody going to know that you're not seeing Daisy Ridley or John Boyega in these well, movies? My mother still thinks that that's Daisy Ridley in Rogue One. <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah, they're like, I can't wait for the sequel. And I'm like, and I thought we, we covered this. I talked to my mom about it with my sister. Said, no, 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 it's a spinoff. It takes place before New Hope. She said, well, I don't get it. That's Daisy Ridley. No, that's Felicity Jones. Well, they look very similar. You got to draw do. her a diagram. Yeah, so I, I have to like really point it out. So now what am I going to do? Like episode eight's going to come out. And she goes, oh, I can't wait for the sequel to Rogue One. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we all want to see a movie with your mom at this point. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's I'm looking fun. at the glistening face that is on the camera right now. And I think we got time for one more question before I turn into a puddle of sweat. And then go to the driving range. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hot in here. All right, Oof. Talisha Tucker writes, Hey, Collider, I'm a short-time viewer, but loving every minute. You're welcome. We've seen <laughs> several... <laughs> We've seen several <laughs> franchises destroyed by prequels, sequels, reboots, prequel, sequel, boots, hybrids. <laughs> Examples, The Matrix, Terminator, Avatar, The Last Airbender, Die Hard, etc. I was wondering, is it possible to save a franchise? If so, how? Well, Talisha, I have some good news for you. Yes, it is possible to save a franchise, although it doesn't happen very often. And much to my, and I'm sure uh, my other two panelists' chagrin, it's probably not going to happen with Die Hard, although that's the one I really need to be saved. As much as I love Terminator and the first Matrix is cool and Avatar had a lot of potential, man, do you, people don't understand how, how what Die Hard used to be. It used to be just Die Hard, man. It was yeah. Die Hard. Then Die Hard 2. For some reason, people don't think it's that. It's awesome, man. Die Hard 2 is great. Die Hard 2. I love Die Hard 2. Awesome. The Die Hard with a vengeance, upset and not Great. Samuel L. Jackson. Love that one. And my family doesn't talk about the other two. No, we and can't. I haven't even seen the other two. You don't two. need to. Yeah, you don't, need, you don't want to. I watched don't one and two, two like back to back, I remember. Not They're too long ago. They're so good. And now with Len Wiseman doing Die Hard Origins or whatever the hell it is, it's like, are Year you one, kidding I think they're calling me with it. this thing? So I don't think it's going to happen with Die Hard, Talisha, and that's the bad news. And sorry I went off on a bit of a rant there. But it has happened in the past. Franchises yeah. can be rescued from bad movies. The two examples that I will uh, offer Terminator to the crew, Genesis, of course. Not Terminator Jenny Whoa. Smith. Yeah. Instead, I am going to go with Rocky Balboa. Okay. Rocky Balboa saved us from the dismal Rocky Five, which was just all kinds of wrong and bad. We got Rocky Balboa, and we bought back into the possible future of some sort of Rocky universe, even though Rocky was getting up there in years, it wasn't going to get in the ring again. Rocky Balboa is the reason why we got Creed, mm. which Ryan Coogler and company knocked out of the stadium. Yeah. So now we have a whole new franchise by saving another franchise. And then I'm also going to say X-Men First Class is another one. That, Great. Yeah, that's a good uh, one. After X-Men The Last Stand, which is you know, the closing of another trilogy, and it seemed like, ooh, these X-Men movies, eh, they look kind of doomed. X-Men First Class really brought back the tone that you want from the X-Men 
and we got to see some of our classic hero characters in a different time period and we also got one of the all-time great cameos but and the wolverine cameo in x-men yeah. first class is more than just a fun cameo it reminds everybody that yes we still have the superheroes that you love from the first three x-men movies existing somewhere in this universe whether it's whatever timeline it's on they can come back at any time I thought that was really cool. How about you, Riley? Yeah, I go to Mad Max Fury Road. I think yes. it wasn't saved per se because it just kind of ended and it just I, for whatever reason. And then George Miller came back mm -hmm. and he made a hell of a movie that everybody loved. So I think I think that's a good example. And I and I want to address the part I think to save a franchise. I think you got to start first with a good filmmaker and especially the script. Sure. And not just throw something together for the sake of the brand name like Terminator Genesis. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good example of how you don't try to, like, they, I don't know what they were trying to do. They were trying to throw all these tricks in there. Let's make John Connor a Terminator now because screw it. Why not? I just think that that was a, that's not the way you maybe do. I thought it was very interesting to have an older Terminator to get Arnold in there. I had high hopes for that, but... Start with the script first. Don't rely on the brand name, which is what I think they're doing with Die Hard again. Just whatever, sure, year one, yeah. Young John McClane, sure. I, just give me a good script and get a really good filmmaker like a Nolan or even somebody like John Favreau who did Iron Man and now has done Jungle Book. He knows how to tell a good story. That's who you need to rely on if you want to reboot these fan franchises in a big way. Uh, Sinead Riley, you guys have two seconds to answer this question. You either get a $100,000 sports car or a pet monkey to play with the rest of your life. Which one do you take? To play with the rest of my life? Yeah. A sports car. Uh, sports car. Okay, well, guess what? You guys don't have to choose because both those things got saved by a good movie and a bad franchise <laughs> as well. That would be Fast Five and Rise <laughs> of the Planet of the Apes. There you Boom. go. Okay. Thank you. That's, I'm out. Oh, yeah, no, that was I good. That was I haven't good. even dropped the mic yet because there's another movie we're forgetting about. What's that? Star Wars Episode Seven: The there Force you go. Awakens. There oh, yeah, you go. That is how you save a franchise right there. Yes. J.J. Abrams, Lawrence Kasdan, bringing Lawrence Kasdan back to write the script. There, there you, go. you go, Talisha. That is how you save a franchise. You get Lawrence Kasdan, you get a pet ape, or you get a $100,000 sports car and some dude named The Rock. That's how you do it. Nice. We solved some problems here today, guys. I I'm hope really that, proud of us. I'm really yeah, proud of us. Yeah, I, th I, I can go drink now. This uh, is, well, I feel very good about this. Well, Sinead and I have been drinking for quite some time this morning. <laughs> Mark Riley, where can everybody find you? Find me at Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram, on the Schmoes No Main Show every Thursday night, and on Tuesdays, Collider Nightmares with Clark Wolf, Perry Nemiroff, and Mr. Schnipp. Well, while I sipped on my cold Coors Light, Sinead had a classy Pinot Grigio. Where can everybody find you, Sinead? I do not drink Pinot Grigio, <laughs> but you can find me online at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com on Mailbags over the weekend on TV Talk tomorrow and back on Friday for Movie Talk. I Woo. am merely Mark Ellis, and you guys can catch me in Northern California the next two weekends. I'll be in Sacramento this weekend at the Punchline Comedy Club. Next weekend, I'll be in San Francisco at Cobb's Comedy Club. You can get tickets at markelleslive.com. That's also my Twitter handle, and check out my movie review channel with my buddy Christian Harloff, Schmozno. Of course, subscribe right here to Collider Video for all the great shows that these panelists are on that everybody loves to watch each and every day. Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you manana. Is that the word? I'm getting the yes. Manana, yes. Hey, manana. guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.